Well, thank you very much, Mike. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'd really like to meet this John Presco guy. He sounds fantastic. <laughs> now, my talk today is going to be really about fundamental physics, but it's also to some degree about technology, quantum technology. And we have information technology today that all of us find impressive, but we all recognize that that will be replaced, say, by the end of this century by new technology that we really can't hope to imagine today. But it's interesting just the same to try to imagine future technologies. And I may not be the ideal person to do that because I'm not an engineer, I'm a theoretical physicist, and I can't claim to be terribly knowledgeable about how computers work. But I do know as a physicist that the crowning intellectual achievement of the 20th century, in my view, was the development of quantum theory. And it's natural to wonder how the emergence of quantum theory in the 20th century is going to impact 21st century technology. Quantum theory really isn't a new subject anymore. It's over 100 years old. But even so, some of the deep ways in which quantum and classical systems differ from one another were just beginning to appreciate in recent years. And a lot of those differences have to do with how information is encoded and processed in these systems. To a physicist, information is something that we can encode and store in the state of some physical system, like the pages of a book. But fundamentally, we know that all physical systems are really quantum systems governed by quantum physics. And so information is something that we can encode and store in a quantum state. And information carried by quantum systems has some notoriously counterintuitive properties. That's why physicists sometimes proudly speak of the weirdness of quantum theory, and we cherish that weirdness and take delight in it. But in recent years, we're more often taking seriously the idea that we might be able to put the weirdness to work to exploit unusual properties of quantum information that would allow us to perform tasks that wouldn't be possible if we lived in a less weird classical world. And that desire to put weirdness to work is driving the emergence of a field we call quantum information science, which gets a lot of its intellectual vitality from three central ideas, quantum entanglement, quantum computing, and quantum error correction. And my goal in this talk tonight is to explain these ideas. So let's start at the beginning. We know that any amount of classical digital information can be expressed in terms of units, bits of information. And we can envision a bit as an object, like a ball, which can be either one of two colors. Now I can take a bit and I can store it for a while. I can put it inside a box. And then later on, if I open the box again, the color ball that I put in comes out again. So I can recover a bit and read it. And quantum information, information carried in the state of a quantum system, can also be divided into units of quantum information, what we call quantum bits, or qubits for short. And for many purposes, it can be convenient to think of a qubit as a colored object stored inside a box. But where now, we can open the box through either one of two complementary doors where those two doors correspond to two different ways in which we could prepare or measure the state of our qubit. And I can put a ball in a quantum box through either door number one or door number two. And then later on, when I open the same door again, the color that I put in comes out again, just as though the information were classical. But if I put information through door number one and then I open the complementary door, then what comes out of the box is completely random. We can't predict it at all. It has probability one half of being red and probability one half of being green. So if you want to read the information that you put in the box, you have to open the box the right way. And if you do it the wrong way, you'll damage the information. And one consequence of that you can appreciate right away if you think about copying quantum information. If I had a quantum copy machine, that would mean I could put some information in door number one of a qubit, make a copy, and then I could open door number one on the original and the duplicate, and the color that I put in would come out of both boxes. 
And similarly, if I happen to have put information in door number two of the qubit and made a copy, then I could open door number two on the original and the duplicate, and the color that I put in would come out of both boxes. But the thing is, there's no such quantum copy machine. It's not allowed by the laws of physics. We can't copy unknown quantum states. And the reason is that to make the copy, the copy machine will have to probe inside the box, and it doesn't know ahead of time what door I use. So if it opens the door that I use, then it can copy the information, no problem, just as though it were a classical bit. But if it opens the wrong door, it will damage the information, and there will never be any way to make a high fidelity copy. So although we might be able to clone a sheep, we can't clone a qubit. Now, there are a lot of different physical realizations of a qubit that are possible, and I'll mention a few others later in the talk, but if you want something concrete to think of for the time being, you can imagine a single photon, a particle of light. That photon has an electric field, and the electric field might be oriented either horizontally or vertically, corresponding to the two colors that you could see if you open door number one of the box, or we can consider its electric field to be oriented either 45 degrees to the left or the right of vertical, corresponding to the two colors you could see if you open door number two of the box. But for now, I'd like to just think about qubits in a more abstract way and not worry about the particular physical realization. Now, the really interesting differences between quantum and classical systems, we can only appreciate if we consider systems with more than one part. So let's imagine that we have two qubits, and they can be far apart from one another. We could have one, say, at Caltech in Pasadena, and one in the custody of my friend in the Andromeda galaxy. And this particular pair of qubits some time ago, when both the qubits were on Earth, was prepared in a particular state with some interesting properties. Namely, I can open my box in Pasadena through either door number one or door number two. And either way, what comes out of the box is completely random and can't be predicted. And the same thing is true for my friend in Andromeda. So neither one of us, by opening the box, acquires any information. But that's kind of funny, because with two boxes, we should have been able to store two bits of information. Where could that information be hiding? The answer for this particular state is that all the information is actually in correlations between what you find when you open a box in Pasadena and you open a box in Andromeda. It turns out in this particular state that if my friend and I both open door number one, we're always guaranteed to see the same color. It could be red or it could be green, but if we open the same door, it's the same. And that's also true if we both open door number two. We both see the same color probability one half of being red or green, but we're guaranteed to see the same thing. And there are four perfectly distinguishable ways in which a qubit in Pasadena could be correlated with a qubit in Andromeda. We might see either the same color or different colors when we bo both open door number one or we both open door number two. And I've chosen one of those four ways. That's two bits of information which is stored in the boxes. But what's unusual is that that information is completely inaccessible locally. We can't get at any of that information by looking at our qubit just in Pasadena or in Andromeda. It is shared by these two distantly separated qubits. And that phenomenon that quantum information can be inaccessible locally and shared by distantly separated systems is what we call quantum entanglement. And it's the really crucial way that quantum information is different from classical information. Correlations are not necessarily a big deal. We encounter them all the time in our daily lives. Usually my socks are the same color, so you can look at one of my feet and you know then without having to look what color sock to expect to find on my other foot. And it's kind of like that with the boxes. If I want to know what my friend is going to find when he opens door number one in Andromeda, I can open door number one in Pasadena. And if, on the other hand, I want to know what he's going to find if he opens door number two in Andromeda, I can open door number two in Pasadena. So it's almost the same thing, and you might think the boxes are really no different than the soxes. But in fact, the boxes are not at all like the soxes. And the essential difference is there's just one way to look at a sock but we have these two complementary ways 
to open a quantum box. And that makes the correlations among qubits richer and a lot more interesting than correlations in a classical system. Now this phenomenon of quantum entanglement is not a new thing. It was first discussed by Einstein and collaborators in a paper in 1935. And to Einstein, quantum entanglement was very unsettling. It seemed to indicate that something is missing from our current understanding of the quantum description of nature, he thought. And that paper elicited some strong and interesting responses, including one that was particularly insightful from Schrodinger, who said, it seems that the best possible knowledge of a whole does not necessarily include the best possible knowledge of its parts. So what Schrodinger meant was that even though we have as complete a description of that pair of boxes that nature will allow, we know everything about how it was prepared, even so, we can't predict what will happen when we look at one of the boxes. So although the whole is definite, the part is random. And it was Schrodinger who suggested that we use the word entangled to describe this correlation, this quantum relationship between the two boxes. And he also said it is rather discomforting that the theory should allow a system to be steered or piloted into one or the other type of state at the experimenter's mercy in spite of his having no access to it. What Schrodinger meant is, it seems rather strange that it's up to me to decide by opening my box through door number one or door number two in Pasadena, whether I will know what will happen when my friend opens his box in door number one or door number two. Now Schrodinger understood that this correlation doesn't allow us to send a message immediately from Pasadena to Andromeda, because no matter what I do to my box in Pasadena, when my friend opens his box through door number one or door number two, he just finds a random bit and he doesn't know anything about what I've done to my box. It's a correlation which doesn't allow us to immediately communicate. Now, this idea of quantum entanglement, the theory of quantum entanglement, didn't advance very much for a long time, for some 30 years, until in the mid-60s we began to think about quantum entanglement in a somewhat different way, not just as something weird and wonderful, but as a resource that we can potentially use to do things. Bell, in particular, described a game that two parties can play. Alice and Bob are playing. They're cooperating with one another. They're both on the same side and trying to win. And under the rules of this game, Alice and Bob each receive inputs, and they are to produce outputs which are correlated in a certain way that depends on the inputs that they receive. But the rules of the game say that Alice and Bob are not allowed to communicate with one another between the time that they receive their inputs and the time they produce their outputs. They can use correlated bits that might have been distributed to them before the game began. But for this particular game, if the players use the best possible strategy, they will win with a probability of success 75% if we average over the possible inputs that they could receive. But Bell pointed out that if before the game began we distributed to Alice and Bob quantum correlations, entangled qubits, then they could play a better quantum strategy and win the game with a higher probability of success. So there's something, namely winning the game, that we can do with entanglement that we couldn't do with just classical correlations. And experimentalists have been playing this game for decades and they keep winning with the higher probability of success that Bell pointed out is possible in quantum mechanics. So these quantum correlations that are stronger than classical ones really do seem to be part of nature's design. Einstein had derided quantum entanglement. He called it spooky action at a distance. This sounds even more derisive when said in German. <laughs> But it doesn't matter what Einstein thought because nature is as experiment reveals her to be and we just have to learn to love her as she is. So the boxes are not like the soxes. You can win a game with a higher probability of success if you have quantum entanglement compared to if you have classical correlation. Is that really such a big deal? Is it a big, yes, yes, it's a really big deal. And you can see, uh, appreciate maybe a little more deeply why it's a big deal, if you think about systems with many parts. 
Imagine a book, for example. The book is 100 pages long. If it were a classical book, there would be bits printed on every page. And if you read one of the 100 pages, you would know 1% of the content of the book. And if you read another page, you'd know another 1% of the content of the book. But suppose instead it's a quantum book. It's written in qubits, not in bits. And the pages are very highly entangled with one another. It's a very highly entangled book. And then if you look at a single page, you see only random gibberish on that page. There's no information on a single page about the content of the book, or hardly any. That's because nearly all the information that distinguishes one highly entangled book from another is written not on the individual pages, but in the correlations among the pages. If you want to tell which entangled quantum book you're reading, you have to make a collective measurement or observation on many pages at once. That's characteristic of quantum entanglement. And in fact, you don't have to have very many qubits, just a few hundred or so, if these qubits are in one typical highly entangled state. And I wanted to completely characterize, right down in terms of classical bits, all the correlations among these qubits, it would actually require writing down more numbers than the number of atoms in the visible universe. So it'll never be possible, even in, as a matter of principle, to write such a description down that completely captures all the correlations among the qubits. And that pro property of quantum information, that we can't hope to express it in any reasonable way in terms of classical information, was intriguing to the physicist Richard Feynman in particular. And it led Feynman in the early 1980s to make the suggestion that if we could build a computer that operates on qubits instead of bits, a quantum computer, then it should be able to perform tasks that we'd never be able to perform with any conceivable digital computer. So what Feynman had in mind is if we can't even hope to write down using bits the content of a few hundred qubits, then perhaps by processing the qubits instead of bits, we can perform a task that could never be emulated with an ordinary classical computer. And around the time Feynman was making this suggestion, there was an undergraduate student at Caltech studying mathematics named Peter Schor. Peter Schor, like all Caltech sophomores, was required because it was part of the core curriculum and it still is, but next year will not be because we're changing the core curriculum. But until this year, every Caltech sophomore had to learn quantum physics, including Peter Schor. And I don't think he ever took a more advanced course on physics than that. But like many Caltech sophomores, he remembered what he learned about quantum mechanics and put it to use some years later to make a rather amazing discovery. An example of a problem that we think is hard for classical computers is finding the prime factors of a composite integer that's many digits long. But what Shor said is that if we had a quantum computer that could operate on qubits instead of bits, the factoring problem would be easy. It wouldn't be much harder than multiplying numbers together to find their product. So according to Shor, the boundary between problems that are hard and problems that are easy, the problems that we'll never be able to solve in the future even with advanced technology and the problems that we can expect to solve eventually as technology advances, that boundary is different than it otherwise would be because we live in a quantum world rather than a classical world. A, a really amazing statement. And to get you an idea, to give you an idea of what this means, about the hardest factoring problem that we can solve with current technology is factoring 193 digits. It can be done by a network of workstations collaborating over the internet in a few months. And if we use the same factoring algorithm that runs on that hardware and the same hardware with the same clock speed to try to factor a 500 digit number, it would take longer than the age of the universe. And we don't expect that to happen for a long while. But suppose we had a quantum computer, we have to suppose it because we don't have it yet, which has the same clock speed as that classical system. It can perform the same number of fundamental operations per second. Then it would be able to factor the 193 digit number in about a tenth of a second and the 500 digit number in two seconds. So the resources that you need to solve the problem scale in a fundamentally different way for a quantum computer than a classical computer. That's what Shor discovered. 
Now, does anybody really care about whether you can factor big numbers? Actually, yeah, actually there are people who care about this <laughs> because the difficulty, the presumed difficulty of factoring large numbers is the basis for public key crypto systems that are in widespread use today, which you use, for example, when you make financial transactions over the internet. If in a few decades quantum computers are widely available, we won't be able to use these systems anymore. They won't be secure, and we'll have to protect our privacy in other ways. Alternatives exist, but it's still not clear exactly how we'll protect our privacy in a post-quantum world where quantum computers are readily available. But the more important point is that Shore drew our attention to a question about computational problems. There's an interesting class of problems, the ones which are hard for classical computers, but which can be solved by quantum computers, and we'd like to understand better what are the problems in that class. It includes factoring, but what else is in there? Well, in fact, quantum computers have limitations, and the problems for which quantum computers can achieve very dramatic speed-ups compared to classical computers are special ones that have a structure which is amenable to the power of quantum algorithms. And in particular, if we consider problems for which in the worst case we have no better method than a brute force search for the solution, then we only expect quantum computers to speed up the solution moderately, not nearly as dramatically as in the case of factoring. That's what computer scientists call NP-complete problems. NP means that once you find the solution, it's easy to check that the solution is correct, and NP-complete means the hardest problems of that type. But it's also important to emphasize that quantum computers can solve problems that are not in NP, that is, the quantum computer can get the answer, but we can't easily check it with the classical computer. We could check it with another quantum computer. And there's a large class of natural problems of that type which involves simulating quantum systems to see how they'll behave. That's a very natural application for quantum computers. We could apply them to the chemistry of large molecules, to the properties of exotic quantum materials, to the quantum field theories that we use to study the fundamental particles and their interactions. In fact, there are computational methods that are widely used by the particle physicists today to predict, for example, what will happen when particles collide at very high energy at an accelerator like the Large Hadron Collider. And those methods are very useful, but the resources needed to solve that problem scale very badly with things like the number of particles that are produced in the collision and the total energy. But with a quantum computer, we would be able to simulate such processes efficiently. In fact, the evidence is growing that we would be able to simulate any quantum process that occurs in nature uh, efficiently if we had a general purpose universal quantum computer. And that's certainly not something that we can say about digital computers, where the resources scale very badly when we try to simulate quantum systems. So quantum computers would be wonderful to have. So why don't we have them already? What's the delay? Well, you see, it's really, 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 really hard to build them. And you might wonder whether there's some fundamental obstacle that will prevent us from ever successfully realizing large-scale quantum computers. One issue that comes to mind is the problem of errors. Quantum computers are very susceptible to failure because of noise that afflicts them. Physicists sometimes like to speak sort of tongue-in-cheek about the quantum state of a cat, which is in a superposition of its dead and live state. We never observe in everyday life that type of superposition of macroscopically distinguishable states of a large physical system. And we understand why not. It's because a real cat will immediately interact with its surroundings, and those interactions will, in effect, measure the cat and project it onto a state which is completely dead or completely alive. And that phenomenon in which a large quantum system, which is imperfectly isolated from its surroundings, we call decoherence. And decoherence is very important for explaining why, for large systems in 
under ordinary conditions, even though the underlying system is quantum, it can be well described by classical physics. Microscopic systems, like individual atoms and so on, which can be well isolated from other uh, physical systems, can exhibit profoundly quantum behavior, but it's very difficult to see quantum behavior in macroscopic systems because they always interact with an unseen environment. Now, a quantum computer won't be very much like a cat, probably, but it too will inevitably interact with its environment at some level, and that can cause a quantum computer to fail. So if we're going to successfully build large-scale quantum computers, we have to find a way of fighting off the damaging effects of decoherence and other possible sources of error. Well, errors are a problem even in our classical lives. Everybody has bits that they cherish, and the trouble is there are always dragons lurking around who try to tamper with our bits. But in the classical world, we know some ways to fend off the, dam the damage caused by the dragons. If I have a bit that I want to be sure to save, I can store some backup copies of the bit. A dragon might come along and change the color of one of the balls, but only one because he hasn't had time to damage two of the balls. And I can employ a busy beaver who frequently checks to see if the balls are the same color. And when one is a different color from the others, he repaints it so all three match again. So my bit is preserved. The dragon has only been able to damage one out of the three bits. It was protected because we stored it redundantly. And we'd like to use that same principle that redundant storage helps us protect information in the quantum world. But there are subtleties, as we've already noted. We can't copy unknown quantum states. So we can't take the state of a quantum computer and store a backup copy in case the original gets damaged. And furthermore, there are more things that can go wrong with quantum information than classical. It may be that a dragon comes along and opens a qubit through door number one and changes the color of the ball. That would be like a bit flip that could occur in a classical system. But on the other hand, the dragon could open the other door and change the color of the ball through that complementary way of looking at the qubit. And that also would be bad, so we have to protect against both types. That second type of error is what we call a phase error in quantum information, which really has no classical analog. And there's another way of thinking about the phase errors. It might be that the dragon doesn't open door number two, but opens door number one, and he doesn't flip the bit, he just remembers the value of the bit or stores a copy of the value that he saw. And that will have the effect of changing the color that we would see if we look through door number two. That's another way that a phase error can arise. And because in most physical systems, it's easier to copy a bit than flip a bit, these phase errors are particularly pervasive and hard to control in the quantum systems that we'd like to use for the hardware of a quantum computer. So really, if we're going to resist decoherence, a key thing, and this is different from trying to control errors in the classical world, is that we have to prevent the environment from finding out anything about the state of the quantum computer during the computation. It must not store any record of what the quantum computer is during, doing during the computation. In fact, if after we've successfully done a quantum computation, and then at the end we ask the quantum computer, what did you just do? It should always give the answer, I forget. There shouldn't be any record left behind of what the state of the quantum computer was during the processing except for the final result at the end. And it's fine for that to be broadcast, and you can tell all your friends but not the state in the middle of the computation. If that were recorded, the quantum computer wouldn't work. So we have to find a way of encrypting the computation, of preventing any information about the state of the computer from leaking out into the environment while we're doing the computation. And that's part of the reason that it's so hard. But we've learned that it is possible to fight off decoherence. How? By exploiting quantum entanglement. We can store the information that we want to protect in the form of some highly entangled state. If I have one qubit that I want to protect, I, it doesn't work to store it in a block of three like we were able to 
protect the classical information, but there's a way of storing one qubit's worth of information in an entangled state of five qubits. And that state has the property that the dragon can come along and do whatever he wants to any one of the five qubits, and no matter what he does, he won't acquire any information about the protected state that's encoded in the block of five. He can't acquire that information because it doesn't reside in the individual qubits. It's just like the 100-page book. The information isn't on the individual pages. The information is in the correlations among the pages. And then we can ask the beaver to come along and check how the qubits are correlated with one another. He can tell if the dragon has done some damage to the correlations, but the beaver also doesn't find out anything about the encoded state, but he is able to correct the damage by reversing what the uh, uh, beaver has done. And so we can redundantly encode quantum information so as to protect it against error. Now one of the heroes of the subject of quantum error correction is Alexei Kataev, my colleague on the Caltech faculty. But when I first met him in the 1990s, he was a scientist at the Landau Institute in Moscow. And the day we first met was really one of the most exciting days of my scientific life because when Kataev uh, gave his seminar and I made these notes, I felt that I was hearing a really transformative idea about quantum error correction. What I learned from Kataev is the connection between quantum error correction and topology. Topology is the word that mathematicians use when they're describing properties of an object that remain invariant if we smoothly deform the object without ripping or tearing it. And in the case of doing a protected quantum computation, we would like the way our quantum computer processes the protected data to remain invariant if we deform the computer by introducing some noise. So we would like to do quantum processing with physical interactions that have topological properties. And physicists have known of such interactions for a long time. We know, for example, that an electron can be transported around a magnetic flux tube and its state will change in a way that depends on the magnetic flux enclosed in the tube, even though the electron never directly visited the inside of the tube. And that change in its state remains invariant if we deform the trajectory of the electron. The only thing that matters is it's that it wound once around the flux tube. So that's a topological interaction. And there at least is a mathematical possibility of more complex topological interactions for particles in two-dimensional systems that we call anions. These anions have the property that if I have a system of many particles, there are a huge number of quantum states which are distinct but which locally all look the same. You can't tell one of these states from another by visiting the anions one at a time. Rather, the quantum information is spread out very non-locally, a collective property of the many anions. And furthermore, that information can be processed by performing exchanges in which the anions swap positions. And so we can imagine operating a topological quantum computer, as Kataev suggested, where we initialize the computer by creating in some two-dimensional system many pairs of anions, and then we process information by performing a sequence of exchanges of the anions so that their world lines in two plus one dimensional space-time trace out a braid in space-time and then when we're ready to read out the result of our computation, we can bring the anions together pairwise and observe whether they annihilate one another or not. So what's wonderful about doing a quantum computation this way is that the information at all times is encoded in a highly non-local way. So it's very hard for the environment to acquire information about the state of our quantum computer and therefore hard to damage the state. So that if we do the computation at low temperature, so there aren't uncontrolled anions floating around. If we keep the anions far apart from one another, except at the very beginning of the computation and at the very end, then as long as we execute the correct braid, we're guaranteed to get the right answer. It's a fault-tolerant way of doing quantum computing. 
Okay, that's how a theorist would describe the idea of quantum computing. But what's the physical system in which we can realize anions? Well, there are several ideas about that. And I'll tell you about one of those, which also involves a suggestion made by Kataya. Uh, Kataya pointed out that there are conditions under which it's possible to split an electron into two parts. Specifically, he said, imagine a wire, a one-dimensional wire, which is superconducting. It conducts electricity without resistance. He pointed out that there are really two types of superconducting wires, the garden variety conventional type and another type, which he called a topological superconductor. Now, if you have a finite segment of topological superconductor with conventional superconductor on either side, then if we add an extra electron to that segment, that electron can in effect dissolve and disappear. And in the process, a change occurs in what we call Majorana fermions, which are localized at the two ends of that segment of topological superconductor. That change can't be observed locally. It's really a joint property of this pair of Majorana fermions. So there's a way of storing information because we could have either an even or odd number of electrons in this segment of wire, and locally we can't really tell the difference. It's a type of non-local topological encoding of information. Experiments have been done which seem to suggest that this type of dissolving an of an electron added to a topological superconductor occurs in some materials that have really been fabricated, but the evidence is still ambiguous and more experiments will need to be done to make that case conclusively. But suppose it's true, how could we use these Majorana fermions for information processing, well, we'd like to be able to exchange them so that we can process the information that they encode. And we can imagine doing that if we have a network of wires with T-junctions, so that if I wanted to exchange two Majorana fermions, I could control the location of the Majorana fermion with some voltage gates and park it around the corner, move the Majorana fermion that was originally on the right over to the left and then unpark the first one. So I have accomplished an exchange of these objects which really behave like non-abelian anions. And many such operations done in succession could be used to build up, well, some of the operations that we need for a quantum computer. So this type of experiment with braiding of Majorana fermions hasn't even been attempted yet, but we hope that in the next few years it can be done. And if it is done, it might be a step towards an advanced future technology. But even apart from that, it'll be a real milestone for physics, demonstrating that a very exotic type of interaction, topological interaction, can be uh, induced by non-local effects in a solid state system. Of course, this might not be the way we build the hardware of quantum computers of the future. There are a lot of other approaches that are under development, and it's kind, kind of timely to talk about, in particular, the work of Dave Wineland, since he was the most recent recipient of the Nobel Prize in Physics, which he shared with another great physicist, Serge Hiroche. Wineland has been one of the leaders in developing the ion trap approach to quantum computing. They've developed the technology over years of effort to trap charged atoms, ions, with electromagnetic fields, hold them in the trap for a long time. And we can imagine that each one of the ions is in either its lowest energy state, its ground state, or some very long-lived excited state. So we can think of them as two-level systems, balls that could be either green or red, qubits. And since these are individual atoms, you might think, well, it'll be hard to read them out. But actually, that's not very hard, because we can illuminate ions with laser light. And if we choose the frequency of the light appropriately, nothing happens if the ion is in the green state. But if the ion is in the red state, it will repeatedly absorb and re-emit the light. So it will glow visibly. And you can read out a series of zeros and ones just by shining a laser on all the ions. Of course, we'd like to do more than read out. We have to process the information in the ion trap by performing entangling gates. And a way that could be done is I could pick out one ion in the trap and address it with a pulsed laser 
choose the frequency and duration of that pulse appropriately, and then nothing would happen if that ion were in its red state, but if it's in the green state, it'll make a transition to the red state and excite a vibrational mode of all the ions in the trap. And then we can pick out another ion in the trap and address it with the pulse laser. Its frequency and duration can be chosen so that nothing will happen if the ions are not vibrating, but if they are vibrating, it will make a transition from red to green and the vibration will stop. So what we've done is we've picked out two ions in this trap. And if the first one had been in its red state, nothing would have happened. And if it was in its green state, both of the ions make a transition to the other color. So if we started out in a superposition of red and green for the first ion, then we would have created a quantum correlated state, an entangled state of the two ions. So that's the type of operation that we would repeatedly do to perform a quantum computation in an ion trap. So at least that's a cartoon of how a theorist sees an ion trap. If you actually go and visit Dave Wineland's lab at NIST in Boulder, Colorado, uh, you, might, you might get a bit of a shock. There's a lot of technical complexity underlying that simple story that I just told you, which may make you hesitant about the prospects for scaling up ion tra trap technology to very large systems with many qubits and many operations. Well, there are ideas about how to do it. People are working on it. It is very, very, very hard. And well, we'll see whether it can be done. But meanwhile, there are other approaches to building quantum hardware that are being developed. Uh, two significant ones are using superconducting circuits and the magnetic field of a single electron. Uh, in the case of a superconducting circuit, I have current which flows without resistance in a superconducting wire. And for practical reasons, this is not really the best way to do it, but for purposes of visualization, we can imagine encoding a qubit by having the circulating current in a small loop be either clockwise or counterclockwise. What's remarkable about that realization of a qubit is that it really involves the collective motion of billions of electrons, and yet it can be well controlled and can uh, remain in a coherent superposition for a remarkably long time, at least if we design our superconducting circuit a little bit more cleverly. Another physical realization is I can consider a single electron which has a magnetic field or magnetic moment, a spin, and that magnetic field, it's like a little magnet, and the North Pole can be either pointing up or down corresponding to the two states of a qubit. And what's remarkable about that realization of a qubit is that it's just one electron, and yet experimental physicists have gotten pretty good at manipulating its state and maintaining a coherent superposition of the red and green state for a pretty long time. So there are a lot of different approaches to building quantum hardware that are under development, and that's good because we don't know which of these, if any, is really going to turn out to be the best approach to building a scalable device. One of the, oh, well, no matter how we do it, we are going to have to use quantum error correction because the quantum hardware is not going to be able to do operations on qubits perfectly. They will be noisy operations. And actually the best idea we currently have for how to control errors in a quantum computer is no matter what kind of hardware we use, superconducting qubits or electron spins or ion traps, to in effect simulate the topological encoding that occurs in something like a system of anions, no matter how we do it, we will want to spread out the quantum information so that it's stored in entanglement among many fundamental qubits in order to protect it. And that will only work effectively if our gates are accurate enough. We'd like the probability of an error per gate to be well below 1%, and we'd like the noise in the qubits to be weakly correlated which correlations in the noise make it harder to control the errors with quantum error correction. Nowadays, uh, error rates of the order of uh, 1% per gate can be achieved in some of these systems. We'd like to bring that down by a factor of 10 or so. That's really, really hard to do, but it doesn't seem impossible. 
To give you an idea about the relative state of the art in quantum and classical information processing, this is an observation made by John Martinez, who's one of the leaders in developing superconducting circuits for quantum computing. He said, suppose we want to factor a big number, a 2048 uh, bit number, that would enable us to break public key protocols as, as they're be currently being used. Well, we could do that with a classical computer. We just need lots of parallelism. How much parallelism? Well, if we covered one quarter of the land area of North America with a server farm, then we'd be able to do the computation in about 10 years. Of course, buying all those uh, servers, it would cost about a million trillion dollars. We'd also have to consume a million terawatts of power, which is about 100,000 times the world's current power output. And the sad news is that we would consume the world's supply of fossil fuels in just one day, and we have to run the uh, program for 10 years. Okay, so now let's compare that with quantum hardware today. Well, John Martinez can make a pretty good qubit for $10,000, or so he claims. If we want to solve this factoring problem, we need something um, like 10,000 logical qubits, which we process in our algorithm. But because we're going to do quantum error correction, we'll need more physical qubits than that, because we have to store the information redundantly, maybe something like 10 million physical qubits. So if we just scale you know, how much it costs them to do a qubit today, we could get that for $100 billion. And, um, the great news is it would run in 16 hours and only consume 10 megawatts. Sounds a lot better. Well, it's not quite as simple as that. You know, even if you had $100 billion, you have a lot of problems to solve in order to get a very complex uh, quantum system to be well controlled, big engineering problems. But at least it's something that we can imagine becoming feasible in a few decades. So there are three questions about quantum computing, which I've touched on. Why do we want to build one? Well, one reason is we would like to be able to simulate any quantum process that can occur in nature. Can we build one? Well, we don't know of any reason in principle why we can't, but we'll have to use the principles of quantum error correction to succeed. How will we do it? Well, we don't exactly know, but there are a lot of different promising approaches to building quantum hardware, which are making steady progress. And I think just addressing questions like these already makes for a compelling research agenda. But I'm not an engineer. I don't want to just build a machine. I'm a theoretical physicist. So I get very interested in the possibilities for applying ideas about quantum computing, about quantum information processing, which we've developed in the last few years, to other areas of physics. And A lot of those applications to other areas of physics have to do with what we call the monogamy of entanglement. Correlations in classical systems are polygamous. They can be shared many ways. So if Adam and Betty both read the newspaper, they have the same information. They become correlated with one another. But nothing prevents Charlie from reading the paper too or everybody else in the room. And so everybody can join the party and we're all equally correlated with each other. The correlations are polygamous. But quantum correlations aren't like that. They're harder to share. So if Adam and Betty are as fully entangled as possible, it means that Betty has used up all of her ability to entangle, and she can't entangle at all with Charlie. If Betty wants to entangle with Charlie, well, she can be fully entangled with Charlie, but only by being completely unentangled with Adam. That's the monogamy of entanglement. And it's very frustrating because Betty might want to entangle with both Adam and Charlie, but she'll always have to make a compromise. In order to entangle more with Charlie, she'll have to reduce her entanglement with Adam. And that monogamy has many consequences. It has consequences for cryptography because Adam and Betty can use their shared entanglement to generate a secret key which they can use to encode a private message. And if they have a way of checking that they really are fully entangled with one another, or nearly so, say by showing that they can win Bell's game, 
then they know that Charlie is completely uncorrelated with them and doesn't know anything about their key. So it's safe to use it without any fear that Charlie can eavesdrop on their communication. And that really is the main idea behind the conference that's taking place here at the IQC this week on quantum cryptography. It's very important in the study of quantum matter because if I have a system with many atoms or many electrons, Pairs of atoms or electrons may want to entangle with one another. They can lower their, their energy by entangling, but if an electron entangles strongly with one of its neighbors, that will reduce its ability to entangle with other electrons. So the system of many electrons has to find a way of relieving that frustration to find its lowest energy state. And that means there are different types of phases of matter which can be characterized by the pattern of the entanglement among the particles. And we're learning a lot in the last few years about how to characterize that many particle entanglement and classify it. And monogamy is even important in the context of black hole physics. I'll tell you a little bit about that. Black holes have been greatly puzzling for decades when we think about their information processing capabilities. And the reason is that Stephen Hawking discovered that black holes emit radiation because of quantum effects, and eventually completely evaporate and disappear. And that leads one to wonder what happens to the information that was encoded in the collapsing matter that collapsed together to form the black hole. If black holes are like other objects which radiate thermally, then what should happen is that all the information that was encoded in the system gets radiated away, carried away by the radiation in some very highly scrambled form. The information is still there, but in a form which is very non-locally spread out and hard to read. But black holes are different from other systems. They have what we call an event horizon. And what that means is the geometry of space-time is very deformed. So I can draw this slice, I've shown it in green, which actually is a slice of constant time. All of the clocks on that green slice read the same time. But that slice actually intersects both the collapsing body from which the black hole formed and the radiation which is emitted by the black hole. So if the information comes out in some highly scrambled form, it means the information is really in two places at once at the same time. That means quantum information has been cloned. That's bad. So we seem to have a rather unpalatable choice. E either the information is actually destroyed, or if it comes out, it seems like cloning has occurred, and that also violates principles of quantum mechanics. Either way, it seems like we have a revolution in physics and have to replace quantum mechanics by something new. Well, a possible way out of this quandary we suggested a while back called black hole complementarity. And the idea is that we shouldn't think of the system inside the black hole and the system outside the black hole as two subsystems of one larger system. We should think of them instead as two different points of view of the same system. So in other words, the information is only in one place, but the observers who are outside the black hole see it in one form, in the form of this highly scrambled information. But the observers who fall into the black hole see the collapsing body. It's just very hard to reconcile those two points of view. There's a very complicated map between what the observers inside and outside see, but they're really seeing the same system from two different points of view. And this idea of black hole complementarity seems to allow us to simultaneously hold three reasonable beliefs that a black hole doesn't destroy information, it just scrambles it up. That an observer who falls into a black hole doesn't see anything unusual happen, at least not right away. Eventually that observer is going to reach the singularity and get torn apart and that's, that's gonna be very unpleasant. But at the moment of entering the black hole, everything seems normal. And an observer who stays outside the black hole sees nothing unusual, just the expected laws of physics. And what was pointed out last year by Elmeri et al, is that there, it doesn't seem to be possible for all three of these reasonable statements to be true at once. And they suggested that the one that we should give up on is number two, that in fact, an observer who enters a black hole doesn't sail through 
the horizon and eventually get destroyed at the singularity, but actually gets, dies a very sudden fiery death right at the moment of entering the black hole. They call that a firewall. So why would they say something like that? It's because of monogamy of entanglement. Because if these three reasonable things are all true, we have these consequences. That if we consider radiation, let's call it Betty, which is just being emitted today from a very old black hole, if information is coming out of the black hole, that means that Betty should be very highly entangled with Charlie. That's radiation that was emitted from the black hole a long time ago. But if an observer who crosses into the black hole sees nothing unusual, it should look like vacuum. There shouldn't be many particles around. But the vacuum is actually a very highly entangled state. In a vacuum, there's a lot of entanglement between just outside the horizon, Betty, and a system inside the horizon, Adam. So this is bad news for Betty. She'd like to entangle with Adam so that nothing unusual happens with the horizon. She'd like to entangle with Charlie so that information can come out of a black hole and she can't have it both ways. We could say, all right, she doesn't entangle with Charlie. That's the alternative in which information is lost when a black hole evaporates. Or she could decide not to entangle with Adam, but that would mean to a freely falling observer it doesn't look like the vacuum at all. There are many highly energetic particles around, and that's the firewall. Well, I'm telling you about this because actually this is an observation or a puzzle that could have arisen a long time ago, but it only happened last year because physicists in many fields, including gravitational physics, are starting to think about physical problems in more of an information processing language, which brought to the forefront this violation of the monogamy of entanglement. Now, physics is a broad subject. There are many exciting frontiers of physics today. We're exploring the short distance frontier, trying to understand the fundamental particles and their interactions at the Large Hadron Collider and other facilities. We're exploring the long distance frontier, the structure and evolution and origin of the universe with more and more powerful telescopes and sensitive instruments to measure the cosmic microwave background. But what I've tried to persuade you is that there's another frontier, also very compelling and very exciting, a frontier of complex quantum states, which we could call the entanglement frontier. In the 21st century, human civilization, for the first time, will be able to in a highly controllable way, prepare states of many particles that are very profoundly entangled. That's something we've never done before, and we can't very well anticipate the consequences of it because we don't have the ability with our feeble minds and the computers that we currently possess to really predict how highly entangled systems will behave, and so we can expect a lot of exciting discoveries. As Mike mentioned, at Caltech we have an Institute for Quantum Information and Matter where we're trying to explore this entanglement frontier across a broad front and from many points of view, both theoretically and experimentally. And you're doing that here in Waterloo where the Institute for Quantum Computing and Perimeter Institute are world-leading institutions exploring the entanglement frontier, making many profound and uh, influential scientific contributions. At the IQIM, we have a tagline, nature is subtle. That is a play on Einstein's famous pronouncement, subtle is the Lord, but malicious he is not. Well, Einstein was a genius, but even, even he underestimated the subtlety of nature when he derisively dismissed quantum entanglement, calling it spooky action at a distance. And what we're trying to do now in quantum information science is to relish, explore, and exploit that glorious subtlety of the quantum world in all its facets and ramifications. Thanks for listening to me tonight. Many thanks for that wonderful, wonderful lecture. Um, we can take a few questions uh, for Professor Preskill uh, related to his talk. I think they're yeah.
yeah, hi. Uh, you seem to um, you seem to describe the black hole complementarity in terms of. Um, sorry, it's not, it's not on. Hello. Yeah. There okay. There you go. Sorry. Uh, so you seem to describe black hole complementarity in terms of. Um, describing the states of an observer inside the event horizon and outside the event horizon at the same time. Now, maybe I didn't totally understand that explanation, but that seems a little strange to me. Uh, what do you mean by talking about observers inside and outside the event horizon at the same time? Well, so, I, so the question is, what did I mean in the, when I spoke of black hole complementarity when I said there are observers inside and outside the black hole at the same time? That's what it looked like, at least. So yeah. in fact, even before I got to black hole complementarity, I, I drew this green slice through the space-time. And so what I meant by that is that that slice is actually space-like. So any two points on that slice are space-like separated points. So we can choose our time coordinates so that that is a surface of constant time. But the important thing is that there's a space-like slice and the information seems to be on that slice at two places. Sounds like cloning of quantum information. Mm -hmm. What are we supposed to do about that? Yeah. And just a quick technical follow-up. Which, uh, which coordinate system do you use to decide that they're space-like separated? Uh, say, like, it, say it once is more. There, is there some special coordinate system where I can see this? Uh, yeah, yeah. In fact, so if you, so I take it that you know a lot about general relativity. I, I know there's coordinate systems. OK. Well, anyway, <laughs> yeah, if you, if you use crustal coordinates, I can draw the slice I mean, if you look at a Penrose diagram, which is, you know, the Kruskal coordinate system and then conformally mapped to make the causal structure clear, I can just draw a slice across that diagram, which looks horizontal, sort of manifestly all at the same time. And most of the radiation emitted by the black hole and the collapsing body both cross that slice. Thanks. Making me run. Stop walking and stuff. Okay, so you had the picture of the five entangled cubits and then the dragon that corrupted one of them. Yeah. And the beaver came and fixed it, right? How did the beaver know which one to fix? Right. So the question is when I had one logical qubit stored in a block of five physical qubits and the dragon came along and damaged one of them, nobody told the beaver what the dragon had done or which qubit he had done it to and somehow the beaver came running out and went right to the correct qubit. How did he know? Yeah, uh, he, he did something I didn't explicitly tell you about so he made some clever collective measurements on the block of qubits, measurements which don't tell him anything about the encoded information. We don't want him to find out anything about it because that would damage it. But those measurements suffice to tell him how the correlations among the qubits have been damaged so that it can be repaired. The important thing is that he does collect some information. He has to know what the, which qubit the dragon hit and what he did to it but he doesn't collect any information about the protected state because that would be fatal. So, so that's the difference between a logical qubit and a physical qubit then? Yeah, so when I speak of the logical qubit, I mean the information that we're really processing, which is encoded in a redundant way in a system of many physical qubits. So that's the quantum generalization of when I took one bit, a ball which was either red or green, and I stored it by having three red balls or three green balls, I had three physical bits storing just one bit of information because they were supposed to all be the same color. And in the quantum case, though, we store the information using entangled states. Um. Uh, given what you've said about how our understanding of information and the role it plays in quantum mechanics has uh, sort of started to change how we see other sciences, for instance, the nature of black holes, um, could you speak a little bit about um, how this is also changing maybe our 
philosophical understanding of the nature of reality and how we should be thinking about things ontologically. So the question is, I spoke about how thinking about quantum mechanics from an information perspective is giving us new insights into different physical phenomena, but is it also giving us insights into the deep philosophical problems about quantum reality? Um, well, I'm probably not the best person to ask this question <laughs> because I, uh, I've never really been convinced that there are any deep philosophical problems about quantum reality. However, some of my colleagues who uh, are very concerned about those questions uh, have developed new approaches to the interpretation of quantum mechanics which are very much informed by quantum information processing ideas. Well, yeah, I didn't tell you in, very, in a very direct way um, what I, well, I said several things. So one thing I said was, so the question was, could I explain already what it is that makes a quantum computer so fast? And um, so one thing I said was that it seems to be hard in general to simulate a quantum computer just using classical bits. That's what I meant when I said if we wanted to describe all the correlations among the qubits, we'd need a huge number of classical bits. So we don't have any succinct way of recording with classical bits the quantum state. So if I wanted to simulate using classical computers what's happening when I process a quantum state, we don't have any way to do it which doesn't require huge resources, like a number of uh, bits which is exponential in the number of qubits. And I said one other thing, without explaining it very much, I said that there's a special class of problems that quantum computers seem to be good at which have the right structure and I didn't say what I meant by that exactly. But in some cases I can put a computational problem in the form of you know, what are the global properties of some function. For example, the period of the function. And the period meaning you know, how much I have to advance its argument before it gives the same answer again. Okay? And if I tried to answer questions like that, classically I'd have to compute the function a huge number of times. But if you, for certain kinds of questions, you can get the answer about the global structure of the function by computing the function a much smaller number of times. And that's really the key in many quantum algorithms to getting a big speed up. Okay, one last uh, question then. Um, when you spoke about quantum error correction, you said like the system has to forget its information and all we need is the end point, end result. Mm -hmm. So does this imply that the quantum computers will be memoryless? Like we can't apply von Neumann architecture on quantum computers. So, I, so the question is, I said that um, in order for a quantum computer to work, it has to forget what happened during the computation. And does that mean that we can't have a quantum computer which has uh, a, an architecture similar to the von Neumann architecture where I have a central processing unit and a memory and I shuttle information back and forth? No, I didn't mean to imply that. A quantum computer can have a memory and a processor. Um, what I meant was that when you cycle through many steps of the computation, of course, the state of the register, the memory and the CPU will be continually updated and we don't at the end want to have a record which says, you know, at time step 1049 the state was X. So the current systems also don't do that, right? Well, that's right, but so in the classical case the computer, so the question is, of course, classical computers don't do that either. They don't normally store such a record. That's right. But 
if information leaks from the computer into its environment, I mean, you say that, the, they, yeah, the computer didn't do that, but maybe the full physical system consisting of the computer and its surroundings does have some information stored in it. Uh, maybe, you know, different parts on the chip were getting hot at different time steps or something, and that heated up the air and left an imprint in the air currents in the room, you know, stuff like that. It's very hard to prevent some leakage of information to the surroundings while you're doing the computation. And it's fine. It doesn't matter. It's okay for all that information to be recorded somewhere else. The computation still works. In the quantum case, it wouldn't work. If there, are in some very hard to read form, if the information were available in the environment of what the state had been at intermediate stages of the computation, then the quantum computer would fail. That's what I meant. So maybe I'll squeeze in one more question um, with Einstein staring down upon us. Um, he, he died not a big fan of, of quantum theory. He thought something was still missing. You're not going to ask me if he were alive today. Exactly. What that's would he exactly think? what I'm going to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> and, or you know, if he maybe would have become a fan, any idea where along the way he would have, what would have changed his mind? Because a lot has happened since. A lot has happened. Um, and in particular, it's uh, tempting to wonder what Einstein would have made of Bell's theorem and whether that would have uh, weakened his uh, deeply held belief that there's something wrong with quantum mechanics and that it has to be replaced by a more complete theory. I mean, obviously, I don't know the answer to that. but. Uh, you know, there are other very smart people. Oh, I don't think I want to go there. <laughs> he might not have changed his mind. Let me put it that way. <laughs> well, let's uh, thank Professor Preskill again for this fascinating lecture. <laughs>